You're listening to The Other 50%, A History of Hollywood. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. This is the podcast where I talk to successful women in entertainment and hear their stories. I am happy to announce our new presenting sponsor, the end-to-end production solution, Green Slate. Producers no longer need to go to the production office to approve time cards, approve POs, review reports, and more, because with Green Slate, you don't have to. Everything is digital, everything is on the app, and you can work from wherever you are. Now, here's where we get meta. I am also announcing that I have taken a position with Greenslate. I'm the new SVP of West Coast Operations. So if you are tired of the old guard in payroll, you can literally call me, 310-789-2001, extension 323. That's 310, get a pen, 789-2001, extension 323. And don't worry, the podcast will continue. Today I talked with Lisa Hammer. Lisa is a film director, writer, and a musician. She is best recognized as the voice of Triana Orpheus on the Adult Swim cartoon, The Venture Brothers. She has written, directed, independent dark comedy feature and short films such as Pox and Puss Bucket, and the CMJ Film Festival winner, The Invisible Life of Thomas Lynch, which she co-wrote and co-directed with James Marandino. Lisa's films have won awards from dozens of festivals, including the CMJ Film Festival, Telly Awards, Hugo Awards, it came from Kuchar Film Festival, the Chicago Underground Film Festival, Canada International Screenplay Festival, Ontario Film Festival, Antimatter, IndieWorks, and two from New York Press. She has had one-woman shows at the Olympia Film Festival, Perth International Film Festival, and the Dulan Art Museum in Shanghai, China. Her surrealist silent film, Empire of Ape, was recently acquired by the Getty Museum's Feminist Film Collection. Her storytelling abilities support not only writing, but her editing, gaining her the reputation for saving shelved films as the edit doctor. We talked about her New York life in the days when it was gritty and when rent control could free you up to be an artist. You can find us at theother50percent.com for added features, photos, show notes, and the merchandise. You can also listen on Apple Podcasts and all the podcast places. Also, the full season of Catch a Break, The Insider's Guide to Getting Into and Navigating Hollywood, is now available on Apple Podcasts and all the podcast places and on the website, catchabreakpodcast.com. Go check that one out, too. Okay, here's my conversation with Lisa Hammer. Have a listen. What do you do? I am a filmmaker, I write, I direct, I edit, I act, I compose. (laughs) (laughs) All the things. If I'm looking at your IMDb, I think you've actually held every single crew position there is, as far as I can tell. (laughs) Probably. I I don't get a lot of sleep, and I definitely have paid my dues working my way up through the crappiest of PA jobs. (laughs) (laughs) You've earned it. You've earned it. Um, I'd love to go back to kind of your origin story. How did you know you were an artist? And then what was your path in? I I don't even know how I realized I was a filmmaker because back in the day, um, like in the, the 80s, when I was in high school and graduating high school, there was no film program. There was nobody was a filmmaker. Nobody talked about being a filmmaker. We did theater and musical theater. So I was writing and directing plays. I was uh, acting in plays, doing opera and, and all kinds of musicals. Fun. Where'd you grow up? Guilford, Connecticut, but I'm from Salem, Massachusetts, actually. Oh. So it was like half and half, half Salem, half Guilford. It was like from, it was like going from like, um, I lived next door to Lori Cabot too, the head witch uh, the, back in the 70s. It was fascinating. <laughs> really fascinating. Uh, and I think that probably is what made me want to go into Wicca myself. Um, oh. When I when I got to Guilford, it was such a wimpy, preppy town. I was like, I'm a witch. And so I was just kind of, you know, running around, like, thinking I was cool because I came from <laughs> Salem. <laughs> and everybody was, like, afraid of me. And I was like, yes. You so, made your mark. Yeah. So I got into Emerson College on a musical theater scholarship and auditioned and all that stuff. And the week I got there, I was I was walking up the street and they were doing that, you know, the they were doing a bunch of songs from fame on the front <laughs> steps. And I was as like, musical theater kids do. Yeah. With, you know, wearing their like piano key scarf and their <laughs> leg warmers and everything. And I was like, and oh, I the was, 80s. 
<laughs> and I was super, super punk goth at that point. Like I was in a band that was opening for ministry in high school and just really was doing the, the rock music scene. So I, I immediately was like, my stomach did a flip and I was like, this is not for me. And like, I, these are not my people <laughs> after all. These are not my people. You know, it's so like, I don't want to be eating dinner with people putting their foot, their ballet shoe up on the buffet doing plies <laughs> while they wait to get food. So I, so I kind of just like marched up into, I, I, I was talking to some film film students and I kind of was like, hold on, hold on a second. I I am laughing so hard because that was literally my college experience. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. The ballet shoes on the table, the the leg up on the chair. Yes. Yes. Oh my God. Oh, Oh, you're taking me back. All right. (laughs) <laughs> Sorry, back back to you. So you moved into film. So I marched up into the film stock room and I said, I need a job. And I got a job in the film stock room. And then I was like, wait, what is all this? And then, so from there, I just switched to film. And I was like, oh, this is what I've been meant to do my whole life. And I just didn't know it. <laughs> oh, thank God you found it. <laughs> I found it. <laughs> but Emerson College was so awful in the 80s it was not a film school yet it was uh the the film stock room was a closet up in the attic with a hole in the roof and like five cameras and no budget we had two steam backs and you weren't allowed to video to learn video editing unless you were a double major with tv journalism so i had to cross register at the school of museum of fine arts where i, I think david lynch went partially uh, and I was much happier there. It was a bunch of weirdos. We did all kinds of weird performance art videos, and I learned how to edit there. So thank you to the School of the Museum of Fine Arts, and no thank you to Emerson College. <laughs> oh, how funny that they were separate <laughs> programs. It's ridiculous the amount of money you pay to go to the school. And I'm now they're like, oh, we're a film school. We've got Avid, and we've got Premiere, and Final Cut, and we've all. I'm like, really, really now. So then you graduated, and then what happened? I uh, I was in a well, I was in a rock band, so I was in the music scene in Boston in the eighties. Whoa! So it was like <laughs> rehearsing down the hall from the Pixies and all these great bands. My God! Uh, oh my God, were you in heaven? Music. I was in heaven. Uh, uh, Mission of Burma, Bird Songs of the Mesozoic. Uh, you know, you name it. The Zulus, it, it just uh, Human Sexual Response, amazing band. So I was getting all my jollies, my stage jollies out uh, in my band. I, that I just didn't really ever gravitate back to, to theater or musical theater, any of that. So we all graduated and I started making this weirdo script called Puss Bucket. <laughs> and we, <laughs> we, <laughs> um, it was a feature film about a Jesus free kicks in the South and uh, being visited by aliens and thinking they're being visited by the Virgin Mary, but it's just an alien. And she, t- she just has them do her bidding uh, and they think that they're being holy. And it turned into this crazy musical. And I ended up, sh- I ended up shooting it. I used the school's camera, so I shot the whole thing in black and white Super 8, whole feature film <laughs> in black oh and white my Super God. 8. No sync sound, it just you know, like five hundred dollar budget shot in like the outhouses in the parks of Boston. And Hold when we on. moved, <laughs> and it was a musical. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when we all moved to New York together in like 89, 90, we continued shooting it. I think it took like three years to finish it on, on pocket change. Totally oh DIY. God. So then my whole, um, my whole plan when I got here, aside from getting jobs was what stage of production am I in with Puss Bucket? What, what job do I need where I can get it done for free? Mm-hmm. So when I needed the film, tra- <laughs> <laughs> like I'll go work at a post house. <laughs> yeah. So when I needed film, and when I needed film, my all of my hundreds of hours of Super 8 film, like just little reels, they're tiny little reels. Yeah. I spliced them all together, and I got a job in a house that um, transferred film to video. 
And they, they were the last house in New York. It was all star film to video, amazing boss, amazing company gone. They were the last place I think in America, aside from Super 8 Sound in L.A., where you could actually have your film transferred to video, your Super 8 film transferred to video on a telecine where you could, like, control oh the speed. You could, could, it was, it, there was tons of control over the look, the speed, the, the, the light, everything. So I had a, an expert transfer after hours and got it transferred. Then I was like, well, I need to edit now. So I looked for an editing job. I started editing at Rafik Video in New York, and I, I was able to edit for free on the nights and weekends. And then I got another editing gig at a place called Bizarre Video in Brooklyn. That was all, <laughs> it was all S SM bondage uh, videos <laughs> and like everything I've seen. I've seen every, everything that's ever been a, a weird fetish. I've edited it at this point. And, I, you know, I was all wholesome and going into my little, like, my little punk rock girl, like, you know, two little plaid dress with my combat boots and my ponytails. And I, You were like, like, look how edgy I am. And they were like, I you don't like, know from uh, edgy. <laughs> yeah, my, my, my supervisor was like this dwarf with a hair lip and, and she was trying to talk me into being a dominatrix the whole time oh my god <laughs> and, and the boss was like this coked out weirdo in this mirrored office that all these kind of tranny hookers would visit and I, I don't even know what went on it was business hours it was on the waterfront in brooklyn I don't know where any of these people are now. <laughs> you were having a late 80s New York experience. It was crazy, but I was able to finish my edit there for Puss Bucket. So thank you so much to those places. They, they helped me when I needed the help. I mean, I got to say, this is scrappy. Yeah. <laughs> so you finished the film, and then what happened with the film? So then I was trying to, I had been interviewed a few times by Film Prep Magazine, and I said, look, I just need a couple, I just need a little bit of finishing fund here to like actually get this out there. What should I do? So they recommended, and at this point, I'm this 22 year old, you know, a horror movie, you know, I, I think everything's funny. I, I don't know. I don't understand the implications of anything at this point. Uh -huh. So they say, hey, since you're a female director, you're one of the only ones we've ever covered. Why don't you put an ad that says female film director will send you nude photos in exchange for money for funding? So I was like, OK, la, la, la. and I'm like, no, <laughs> I had no intention of doing it, but I thought I would make it this joke. So I did it and I got money from Penn and Teller and like all these other people. <laughs> and then I sent them this long, angry feminist letter. <laughs> like, how dare you ask me for naked pictures? <laughs> yeah, basically. And they all, all except one, they all wrote back thinking like, oh, that was hilarious. That's a really good one. Thank you. Keep the money. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. So I'm thinking in, in, if this had happened now, can I, can, I want, I'm oh, sure no. that the guys that no. The guys no. that run the magazine, I'm sure they have wives, daughters, sisters, mothers. Would they ask the, those women to do the same? I mean, back then it was funny. And we were all doing edgy, punk, funny, weird stuff. Oh, now I think everyone would think it's, it's a trap. It's a trap. Now, like, he would be called out for, like, you know, for even suggesting that a woman do this now. Like, he would be in trouble for even suggesting this at this point. But back then it was hilarious. As he should be, honestly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, no, no nude photos were exchanged. It was just a big fun joke. But looking yeah. back, I mean, I look back in horror at what if he tried, if I tried to do that, you know, if I was recommended to do this now, I'd be in the Me Too movement, you know? <laughs> of course. Of course. It's crazy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It is. And when I see these guys at the, the Comic Cons, they pretend not to know me. I think they're kind of embarrassed <laughs> about the whole thing. <laughs> and they're disappointed that I didn't send out any nude photos. That that might be part of it, but I'm not going to be doing that. <laughs> no, that's hilarious. <laughs> so then that happened, and I w I finished everything, and I got a beautiful illustration of the cover from my sister in law, and I'm standing in the post office putting a package together, trying to get distribution, and this really nice guy just walks over and starts looking at the artwork and he goes, 
what is this? I go, oh, it's my film. I'm trying to get distribution. And he's like, well, why don't you, here, here's my card. Why don't you come to my office? This looks really funny. And I, and I go, I look at the card and he was like the buy, the main buyer for tower video. <laughs> Are you kidding me? No, it was at the Prince street post office, just in Soho. We just, he just happened to be like behind me in line or something. Oh so my I God. go in, I know I go in and he, he's the nicest guy. No, you know, no foul play. And he hooked me up with these distributors that, Basically, I think it was fast forward distribution and some other company and they manufactured the VHS tapes <laughs> yep. and it got into Blockbuster Tower. It was mentioned on MTV. I was like, are you kidding me? This is a, the, the worst movie ever made was my goal because I <laughs> love like the schlocky B movies and Ed Wood and all that stuff. And it went further than I ever imagined. I spent like $500 on it. And I made in the 90s, my gosh, it was in the tens of thousands of dollars oh on the, selling the VHS tapes. And it, I like it, op- it played after a Cramps concert. It got me music video jobs at Sony. It, it like, I got prison mail. I had people saying they want to kill, kill, kill again after watching it. It was <laughs> a were, giant success. <laughs> There were riots at the screening. There was like this, some trannies would start to come in their leotards and throw chairs across the room and beer bottles and start singing to it. (laughs) It became a cult classic. It did. And I'm so happy that it did. That's amazing. It just got picked up by trueindie.com or uh, trueindie.tv. So it's T-R-U, Indie, I-N-D-I-E dot TV to be. Wait, recently? Yeah, to be streamed again. I'm thinking, how in the world is this still happening? <laughs> this is the little piece that could. Oh, my God. So now we can all go watch it. <laughs> you can go watch it at trueindie.tv. Be prepared. Oh Make sure you're on plenty of drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Heads up. <laughs> so that must have led to other things. It did. I, it did. But here, here's the truth of the matter. I... I soon found uh, one of those legendary New York City rent control apartments that you only hear about in legend. Like I found a $300 one bedroom in Little Italy, no Lita. And I, you know, moved in with my then husband, who's now Doc Hammer of the Venture Brothers. And we, we didn't have to work. I mean, we just made art. So we became these New York indie darlings who we weren't really striving for anything except artistic purity. So I never, I never made that the bold move to try to actually get into the industry. I avoided the industry and I, I was like a purist and you know, my stuff was for museums. I had, I had things that were going in art galleries and museums. I've got a a piece at the Getty Museum now. So for me, I was more of a museum experimental filmmaker. And that was, I would say through the eighties and nineties, almost into the naughties. I, I just didn't, I didn't have the worries. Oh my God. Do you still have that apartment? He kept, he kept it. I left. I I went to Hollywood. (laughs) Okay. So you were basically a character in rent. (laughs) But if it was like a super punk goth underground rent. Oh my God. It's like. Maybe maybe call it squat. I would, I would have been in the place squat. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. That's so amazing. (laughs) So that was that that was that and then we just kept making I made a lot of experimental um, fairy tales. I was really into Grimm's fairy tales. I I started working with this amazing cartoonist Dame Darcy and we started making these silent film comedies and weirdo uh, experimental films. I can't even like the one that's in the Getty right now is called Empire of Ache. It's a super eight. I worked in super eight for a long time and I did all those super masters of super eight tours and all that stuff with the media loft and okay. anthology film archives and all that. So we did this super eight film called empire of ache and Dame Darcy plays a girl in a psychiatric asylum, in a, like an old fashioned asylum. And look, we use the basement. Do you remember the Casbah, the vintage thrift store? Yes. Well, our friend Roxana worked there and she let us use the entire basement, which is this just rocky, it looks like a quarry. It looks like this weird prison from 1810. And so, and inside that basement were boxes and boxes of costumes and fabric. And and so Darcy brought her paints. We had a couple other artists and we just 
We got down there, we put the characters, we laid them down on the fabric and drew around them and cut out the costumes and stapled them on and painted them to look like German expressionist film characters. The the walls were painted, the windows were all fake and made, you know, painted on a piece of of a white sheet and then we had um just some incredible we found a bunch of stuff in the garbage that we made puppet heads out of and put some people in puppet costumes oh um, i think like i think james thurwell from fetus visited visited the set and then got really confused and left <laughs> like what is happening here yeah, we had like the smoke machine going and puppets and a and a girl like this one armed girl and a really evil looking nurse. Uh, and it's just a really fun film that we we ended up making and showing and it got into a bunch of festivals and now it's at the Getty, which is cool. Really yeah, cool. I'm looking at IMDb right now and the tagline is "A girl is tormented by ghosts and raw meat." Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she's given a, a a big needle full of something, and she wakes up and like this plate of meat starts talking to her. <laughs> so, yeah, but he helps her escape from the tormenting uh, nurse and all of the other uh, tormenting uh, people in her life through a through a door in the wall. Wow. So Darcy and I we did a uh, we did a New York City cable access TV show on MNN. So in like 1996 to 99, uh, I get we won like best cable access show from New York Press. We did we just did everything like that. We painted these weird sets and made this weird variety show and had our friends come be guests, like contortionists, poets, musicians. Darcy would do the singing saw. We would show clips of underground films and silent films. We would make these weird comedies that look like silent film, just absurd, absurd stuff. And we would just do these things where we'd go out in public and Darcy would just make complete, just a psychotic mess of herself and start screaming and laughing and running around. And we would videotape people's reactions. <laughs> it, was, it was a really fun time. <laughs> I don't even know what to make of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, it sounds like you had the best time. <laughs> oh my god, it's been amazing. It really has. It's. I gotta say, it's been a blessing to be able to do all this stuff on my own with no interference. I I've been avoiding Hollywood and the industry for so long because I'm just afraid of losing control of my work and my creative process. You know, is this just the blessing of what rent control can do? Yeah. Yeah, it was. I, I cried when I when it happened. I I wept and and I thanked them. It was it was a mafia house. It was a, it was. It's not on the books, so it's like probably a kill room, a kill house. Oh, um, there were holes holes in the floor and the wall, and it just it wasn't registered as even being in the housing authority department at, at all. Oh, so God. yeah, and I think the the owner died in prison, and you know his kid and his grandkid all were in prison it's just full full mafia it was like right across the street from the um what was that john Gotti, the uh social like raven Knight social club was right across the street uh, so it was it was a it was a safe street for me <laughs> you know <I> know. <laughs> they they were on every corner making sure nobody got mugged robbed any of that stuff it was pretty oh, cool for sure. now did you ever did you ever try to like get into the mainstream? No, I, I'm just kind of trying right now. Yeah. Cause I don't have a $300 rent anymore. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, Oh man, then you got to make money and you're in New York city. Yeah. It's not a sin anymore. I used to think that it was like a sellout or like, I really, really was against it. And now I'm like, what was I thinking? That's so elitist and stupid and lame. I was sharing the rent. Uh, we were in a cool band. We were making weird art with, we were, you know, we had like, we, I directed Courtney Love in an episode of doll making. And we had uh, the singer from Sonic Youth came in for our Christmas special and like wrote a song for about us and sang it to us. Thurston Moore from Sonic Youth came in. It, we were, and you know, like Nick Zed was coming and hanging out and, and our Kern and, you know, Jim, Jim Fetus and, we were just in Tony Millionaire. I mean, we were just surrounded by the coolest of the cool. So nobody was really selling out yet. Everybody was trying to keep it cool and DIY. And nobody needed to really sell out at that point. There was affordable rent. There was a thriving art scene in New York. There was a thriving music scene. 
And we were just in our bubble of utopia, loving each other. It was amazing. Yeah. Like, I want to see the movie about your life. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you can sort of see part of it. Um, Levi, my hus- Levi Wilson, my husband, uh, was really entertained by some of the stories of being in a band and the things that would happen. So he talked me into co-writing with him our series, Maybe Sunshine, which is it's on YouTube now, but we're trying to get it developed for television. So Maybe Sunshine is about a woman, me, in my in her 50s trying to start a band in New York. And it's really funny because, you know, the things that happen to you when you're older and nobody cares about you unless you're young and beautiful, you know, you, you're just not relevant anymore. And so you're trying to, you're trying to still be relevant and fit in and do what you love. Like if, if you only know how to do music, well, what do you do when you're 60 and you haven't quite made it into the yeah. you know, mainstream and don't have like royalties coming in? So oh God, that's what a great premise. <laughs> we incorporated all the old, funny, weird stories of what had happened to me before uh, into the series. And uh, it's pretty funny. I, I'm, I'm really disgruntled, like kind of like Larry David. <laughs> and I just get in fights with everyone. And I'm just like really just so disturbed that I never got famous. And it's it's a funny show. It's, it's on YouTube right now. It's called Maybe Sunshine. Okay, everybody check that out. And then tell me about... Tell me about the sisters' plots. So I was directed in a short film by Shade Roop, who's this amazing underground film scholar, archivist, director, actor. He's written many, many, many books on underground artists and film. He asked me to act in a short film, and one of the other actors, aside from my husband Levi, was this girl, Lisa Ferber. And the minute we saw each other, we our minds were blown. The same way that I, I had been 10 years earlier, 20 years earlier with Dame Darcy, we saw each other in the hall wearing like these German doll dresses and like <laughs> bows in our hair. And we were like, we just pointed at each other and started screaming. So <laughs> it was, a, almost, <laughs> it was a, you, it was almost the exact same thing where we looked at each other and we were like, you, <laughs> you are my people. Yeah. And she's a playwright and a painter, so uh, she asked us to start performing in her plays, and one of them was The Sisters' Plots and an evening, uh, Afternoon of Tea or something like that. And so we did it at the Producers Club, and it was a musical, and I was thinking, like, we need to make a web, a web series out of this. So I said, Lisa, we need to make a web series out of this. I'll just I'll grab my little camera. We'll just we'll, – we'll fool around. We'll putz around, and we'll make some fun stuff, and – uh, she was really close friends with Eve Plum from the Brady Bunch at the time. So she agreed to do it. And Levi's in it. And we did this sort of early kind of web series and put it up on Funny or Die. And it got to the top five video, most watched video comedies. And sen- then I said, well, now we've done this. Why don't we turn it into a feature film or a TV show? And so she and I started, we sat down and we, we wrote the story. We, we drew it out on paper. I made it a chart of how things should go. And then she wrote the dialogue and the, the lyrics. And we had this amazing composer from, I think she's, she's done some, a lot on Broadway, Mary Feinzinger. And mm-hmm. she wrote all the music. Lisa Ferber wrote the lyrics. We, we wrote the story together. She wrote the dialogue. It's very clever and funny and, and broad, but surreal. So I would say that um, it's sort of like Grey Gardens. If, either John Waters or Ed Wood had directed it <laughs> uh, with a little Busby Berkeley in there. We, we have a pie fight at the end and it's just really a lot of fun. And we, we shot that with our own pocket money. Again, we did some fundraisers. We raised money on Kickstarter and Indiegogo and, and, you know, met our goals and just kind of shot it every weekend for three years and snuck a crane into central park to do a big dance number. <laughs> Uh, what? <laughs> yeah, it was just how a do you, How do you yeah. sneak a crane in the Central Park? I, well, you, you get a picnic permit, and then you say you're going to have a picnic, and then you hire a guy with a jib arm to sneak it in the duffel bag, and then you set up kind of in an area that nobody can see you, <laughs> and you tell them you're just going to be rehearsing with your dance troupe, and you throw the camera on, and you really quickly do your dance number and shoot it and then leave. <laughs> okay, guerrilla filmmaking. I like it. 
Central Park has been so good to me. I, I've never had any trouble. I've been shooting in there, my fairy tale film, since the 90s. I, uh, Jorinda and Jorangal, which is a Grimm's fairy tale, uh, again, Super 8 black and white film, went in there with my Super 8 camera and just went through the, the ramble or the bramble, whatever it's called, and used the castle. And I, you know, I, I think I paid a $25 permit and they're just really good to artists. They really care. They, they, they want to help you. They want to make sure that you, you know, they don't want to bar you from using the park. Yeah. For, you know, film and photo shoots. They're really good about it. Oh yeah. I know many a student film was shot around that castle. Yeah. Absolutely. I think I was in one that was shot at that castle. <laughs> Come to think of it. <laughs> it's funny because if you have, if you have somebody in the foreground standing just in front of the, the modern flags, you can hide all of that with their body. And then you just see the castle in the background uh -huh. and it looks like you're in another century. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> so I saw somewhere that you are an advocate for kind of older women in filmmaking and entertainment. Can we talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. Absolutely. I know I haven't dug around everywhere yet. I'm just starting out looking for grants and, you know, pipelines and, and, programs and you know all those you know fellowships and all that stuff but it seems to me and upon first glance and second and third glance that it's there's this great wonderful movement for women directors and women writers but they're all young and new and fresh and nobody's mm -hmm. really talking to the older ladies who may be getting a late start there was one Meryl Streep I think had the only over 40 program that I had ever seen in my life for women. Oh, the writer's lab? Something like that. Yeah. And it was, it was just the one and I don't see anything anywhere else to service our community. And there's quite a few of us. I'm not the only one that, that like started late or decided to, to try to break in late. You are not the only one. And you know, I was at a, I was at a meeting at the writer's guild one night and the women there were talking, it was, it was a women's group, and they were saying, you know, the young women should be just as concerned about the careers of the older women yeah. because we're all going to get there and you want yeah. there to be as many opportunities. Absolutely. And it's a huge market. I'm telling you, Gen X and Baby Boomer is a huge market. We've got yes. life experience. We have so much life experience. We can tell stories in a more mature way. And it's not young and flashy. And, you know, like, I, I just think it's kind of almost condescending. If you're like, oh, come on, women, come on in. Let's give you some jobs. Only the, the cute young you know, the new, the new fresh, nubile 20 somethings are, we'll, we'll give them a chance, but you older ladies, uh, you're crusty. Maybe we won't, we won't give you a chance. <laughs> not, not, not quite as exciting. <laughs> no, we're not as exciting, <laughs> which is sexist in itself. I think ages, of course. And sexist, you of know, course. Of course. Oh, we'll have more women around. Sure. But make sure they're young and cute you know, yeah. and a single. <laughs> but I, I think the irony is, is that the, you know, the demographic, with the purchasing power is the older women. Exactly. So you put your stories out there and oh, lo and behold, it's people are identifying like a lot of people are identifying with this. Yeah. It's a huge segment that really is being completely ignored. And I think that it's detrimental to the whole industry to ignore this segment. Well, to the whole fabric of the culture. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So I, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be making this kind of uh, self-deprecating humor when I was in my 20s. I was doing different stuff. And now it's universal. It's self-deprecating. It's funny. It's it's sad. It's it, there's so much life story behind it that I wouldn't have had in my 20s. So. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you, how do you feel like your art has changed? I think I'm way more serious now. I feel like back then I was just beginning. I was really in, just loved schlocky B movies and, and the Texas Chainsaw Massacres and all the horror and the gore. And now that I've been through horror in my own life, <laughs> I don't seek that out anymore. I just seek really good stories, really good characters, people that I can love and identify with or hate, you know, I, I seek more substance now, and, mm -hmm. and I think my work has more substance than it did before. It's not just fun and gimmicky. You know, it's real people. I almost hate to ask, but what do you mean by the horror you've gone through? 
uh, breast cancer, uh, mother, you know, deaths, uh, horrible deaths of, of people, mother, best friend, guitarist. Uh, I mean, so many, so many Just are like gone. A lot of real life One happening. Yeah. 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 And how are you now? How's your health? I survived the breast cancer, but I am uh, having a very big struggle with the side effects and, and trying to get, uh, trying to not have rheumatoid arthritis and fibromyalgia and all the lovely things. Oh. That, yeah. <laughs> all the autoimmune that gets us later on. Yeah, especially triggered by five really strong chemos. It's, um, it's re- and we're just in the beginning stages of trying to figure out what is wrong with me at this mm-hmm. point. So. Uh, but, you know, I'm not going to let that stop me. And, and I think it's made me a, a better person, a, a more serious person, a more serious artist. And somebody, you know, like, I actually want to go through the steps and, and do the things I need to do to be a really good writer, to, to get to be a really good director, to get into the industry, make my mark. I'm not just sitting, you know, in my high tower uh, of, of coolness, like laughing at everybody anymore. I'm, I'm actually ready to jump in and, and do this now for real, you know after living through all of this. Yeah. Well, it sounds like, it sounds like you're focused on meaningful work. Yeah, absolutely. Time, life is short. <laughs> yeah. And that's so delicious and juicy. And yeah, and that's, I, I think you should be doing it. I think so too. What else is there? What else is there? What am I going to do with my time? Am I going to have gone through all this just to be like, oh, I'm going to make some silly little super eight film and you guys all suck because you sold out. No, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> You can afford to do that when you're 20 and nobody's died yet and your health is perfect and you're cute and thin and, and everybody loves you. And, you know, you can afford to be that kind of art snob. Yeah. And not to say there's not value in that work, too. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I am so happy I did all that. I'm very proud of it. It's ridiculous. It's out there. I mean, period piece. I made a film in 2006 called Period Piece, and it's this psychedelic retelling of the 1970s films that were sex education for what they called trainables at the time. And they are for Down syndrome uh, patients. There's one about a a Down syndrome little girl talking about when you, one day you're going to get your period and here's what it's going to be. But for trainables back then, and which was, that was the actual medical term. Sounds horrible. I know. It does sound horrible. That's, That's what they called the people. The people were called trainables? The, the, the Down syndrome patients, yeah, were called trainables at that point by the medical establishment. Ew. You can, you can find these films out there. They're, they're sex education for trainables. So when I saw it, I was so taken aback. I was so shocked. Not only was I shocked by the terminology and what was happening, but I was shocked at what it what looked like to me, the production value looked like what you do with a porno set during the day when you're not shooting porn and the porn actors were like the mom and the dad and the sister. They all look like they look like they were just in the gutter and they were just doing a side job after the porn shoot. And so these films, they would, what they do, they call them trainables because if you use repetition, like repetition, 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 Uh they will eventually learn what they're supposed to learn. So this film was about getting your period. So the mother, the father, the sister would say, uh, you know, the girl would say, hey, mom, you know, does do do all women get periods? And the mom would say, yes, Jill, all women get periods every 28 days for three or four days. Blood from inside a woman's body comes out from a hole between her legs. And then, like she would ask dad and he would repeat the same thing. And for like however long the film was, it was far too long. They would just repeat it over and over and over again. And they would show her the pad, blue, white, blue, white. Look, it has sticky stuff on one side. Yes, Jill, it has sticky stuff to stick to your panties. And so we we got really, really, really wasted on tequila and reenacted it <laughs> as adults with crazy makeup on our faces and wigs. And I think I put like an octopus doll in my underwear. <laughs> Oh my god! And we we reenacted it and shot it, and it was that was 2006. It was just in another festival. It's been in festivals since 2006. It get, keeps getting asked back to these menstruation festivals, 
secret women's festivals in Pakistan. It was just in a Medu- the Medusa Film Festival. And it's been written up as like this psychedelic, it, like it's like a psychedelic, actual psychedelic film because of the repetition, because of the mesmerizing way we're, we're acting so weird and just the film, we made it look like old film. Um, so period piece was actually just also picked up by true indie TV. So That's so funny. There. So it sounds like you and your friends are just messing around. Yeah, we were. And then these pieces like take off. They do. They do. <laughs> we, we're we're channeling some kind of insanity, and it's it's hitting a nerve. Yeah, you're tapping into something in the zeitgeist. That something. The zeitgeist doesn't even know is out there. I, exactly. Exactly. They don't know what hit them. <laughs> that is so funny. I mean, now, it just I'm, keeps happening. I want to hear what you think of kind of what has happened with women and the women's movement in the last couple of years. I am so, so happy that the Me Too movement started. Um, it's needed to be there. I've been harassed. Everybody, every woman I know has been harassed. It's, you know, you just something you kind of dealt with. Of course, the older women are like, you know, grow some balls, get over it. This is what happens. But it's like, yeah, I, I don't want to over sensationalize and, and be in a culture of pure outrage all the time. I don't want to be always outraged. So I, I don't mm-hmm. get outraged like that. Um, and I think it can, it can take it to an excess. Uh, for me, I thought that the, the line can be stepped over and it kind of delegitimizes what, what's happening with real abuse and real rape and, you know, things that I feel like they're taken less seriously when, when things like the Aziz Ansari story come out and it's essentially a a story of a really, really awkward, bad date in, in what I, what I got out of it. And when that's held in the same light as multiple rapes by Weinstein and, and other, you know, I've been harassed so much. I've never been raped, but I've been really seriously harassed and I've, I've been, you know, taken off of jobs or not given jobs because I was a woman. I've been through all of that. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that I would consider the things that happened with Weinstein to be abuse and rape, but I would not have ever considered if I had gone on a date like that ended that, that awkwardly and badly, I never would have considered that as abuse or rape. So I think there was a kind of a turning point there, unfortunately, and I wish it hadn't happened. Uh, there was a lot of blowback after that, and I think that it kind of uh, took the wind out of the sails a little bit of the movement. Uh, and I do, uh, I really grieve that. Well, I hope that because I, yeah, I remember when that happened. I totally get what you're saying, and because to me that that started a different branch of conversation that was about consent. Yes, I, I would love it if we could all like hold space for all the nuanced conversations because the issue is so much bigger than just uh rape you know what i mean and i I think absolutely absolutely and i'm and i'm not disagreeing with you at all just just you know but i'm saying as a a culture i think we need to have all of those conversations and it it's hard in our current climate because there's no nuance in any media conversation there's there's not any nuance i agree it's so hard, but it's, and, and I think we're still, I think we're still just scraping the surface. Oh, we sure are. <laughs> I mean, even when I, when I met, um, you know, Penn and Teller had given me money for my film. And a few years later in the nineties, I went, I was at, I was, my band was playing at the CMJ festival and he, who's the tall one? Is that Penn? Oh, I never can tell you. <laughs> the, tall, the, the big, tall, hairy one. Uh, he was there Penn, doing yeah. a panel. Yeah, he was doing a panel, and I walked up and I said, "Thank you so much for donating to my film." And then he said he screamed to the whole room, "Oh yeah, you look totally fuckable! Ha ha ha! Yeah, I'm glad I gave you money." I was like, really? "Okay, we're done here." <laughs> Dude, in front of the whole room of men and women, everybody, professionals, people who came to see my band. I mean, everything was, it was really humiliating. And I was so shocked. I didn't know what to do. I just gave him a sarcastic smirk and said, man, yeah, nice, real nice. And then walked away. So yeah, like, can we stop doing stuff like that? 
That would be great. I don't Come think on. it'll happen. And I don't, I don't, I, I'm a little bit afraid to police everyone too much. But uh, if we could teach the boys some sensitivity, <laughs> maybe some training at home, you know, yeah, start I, with the parents, I maybe. We, <laughs> I think we just want people to behave better. Just I mean, be nicer, the, better people. The bar is low, but could we just have people behave better? It would be great. There's a place for that kind of humor, and that would be at his own show on his stage where people will go there to hear that kind of thing. It was inappropriate. It was not at all. It was somebody thanking him for giving, donating money to a film in a professional setting. And, you know, I, I think that that kind of thing is very normal back then. And right, but then the result is it shut you up. You're you're not a yeah. professional anymore, and you you just got to go away. Yeah. Like, it's, yeah. I mean, I'm telling you, this kind of – uh, this kind of behavior and this kind of thinking uh, kept me was one of the main things that kept me from trying to break into Hollywood aside from losing creative control uh, and not being in c control of my projects anymore. It was just, I was terrified of, of the casting couch and of the things that people had said they had to do. I, I didn't want any part of that. I, yeah. I, I, I'm so completely modest and boring as a, you know, in that area that I just, I was like, I'm, I'm not going to jump into this like pig pile of slime. <laughs> so I stayed away. So yeah, yeah I, you know, it's a shame. It's a shame that, that women weren't encouraged more without fear back then that I'm sure I could have broken in a lot sooner than now. <laughs> no, and I, I think that's, I, I think that's not such an on uncommon story and, you know, in varying yeah. degrees, it would have been silenced and shut out for years. Well, it's true. And, you know, I, I watched the show Veep and one of the things in the last episode that she says to the younger woman running for office is, you know, I paved the way for you. I dealt with hands up my dress and, you know, and ridicule yeah. and obstacles so that you could run for office unencumbered, basically, you know? So yeah. I do have pride that I, I kind of, I paved the way for a lot of these girls. Um, but I would certainly love to be not considered a dinosaur. I, I would love to be considered a viable, <laughs> a viable artist who, uh, you know, who deserves to have their their work shown and, and yeah. produced. Julia Louis Dreyfus is not the only one. But <laughs> no, can we, can we just pause for a moment to say how brilliant that show is? Oh God, I love it so much. I love I, it. I just watched that episode last night. I just laughed <sighs> out loud the whole time. Yeah, the whole time. I love it. I love, <laughs> and and there there is plenty of filthy horrifying humor in that and it's it's in context so it's absolutely appropriate to say the, those horrible things that all the characters say absolutely. yes and they're horrible and so horrible. funny <laughs> yeah. horrible oh my god horrible jonah humans. should never oh my speak god. again in public um, <laughs> i feel like that the, that poor actor i think he's gonna have a lot of trouble after the show he, he's gonna be so hated <laughs> And he, you know, just the character, the pariah, just because of that character, that uh, he's going to have a really hard time. <laughs> I think I feel bad, but no, it's Wait. brilliant, and I love the but, fact that it's a, a older female character who is curmudgeonly and not trying to be this good, virtuous person. She's filthy mouth. I mean, that's she's kind a of horrible maybe, mother. She's a horrible mother, and that's kind of how maybe Sunshine is. It's like I'm just a nasty person. I'm angry and grumpy and I'm not going to behave. These That's women are hilarious. not going to behave. It's you know, hilarious. why should we behave? We don't need to behave. Come on. <laughs> Well-behaved women rarely make history. No, they as, don't. As the bumper sticker says. It's absolutely true. Okay. Tell me this. What advice do you have for women coming up behind you? Well, I just am finding out for myself that there are quite a few programs out there where you can actually get your foot in the door. There are mentorships. There are fellowships. There, I would say, first of all, number one, uh, aside from getting, you know, going to film school or going to, um, you know, write, taking writing classes, um, 
Film school is iffy for me because sometimes, half the time, I, I think you should just not go to film school, maybe get a different degree, and then just go work on a film set because you're going to get, mm. you're going to jump right into work. You're, you're going to really, that's, that's going to be a free education, and then you're going to go right into work. You can start getting your days for, you know, the DGA, or you can get training, you can do mentorships. Um, but if you really want to go to film school, then, you know, do that. But when you get out, join NIWIF, join Women in Film, join Film Fatales, join these groups and start networking and keep making your films, keep making your films out of your pocket change, but really try to write something and create something, maybe a short film that is just really undeniably good. It, it, it could be, it's shot in a, in a way that is uh, industry standard um, don't try to make a bunch of weird experimental films for years. You're going to spend all your money and nobody's going to take you seriously in the industry. And um, you're not going to have a rent control apartment. In Little you're Italy. not going to have rent control. Those days are gone. You're going to be paying <laughs> quite a lot in rent. And so I think you should take, uh, take advantage of these groups. Uh, they have a lot of older women who are, are mentors. You can put your resume in, you can volunteer to work on their films. You can build your resume. Um, I definitely, have helped a lot of my interns and my volunteers. Uh, I, I've trained them the best I could, and and they're all working in film now. And I think that's a really good way to go. And um, in the meantime, keep writing and keep getting getting better. And you know, submit to the blacklist um, when you've got a script you think is good enough. And you know, you gotta have to you're gonna have to dish out some money to join these groups. Film Fatales has a parody pipeline where they if you, know, you sign up with them and you pay your, your, of course, your dues. And then they can help sort of send, you know, recommend and send your scripts out to different um, women's uh, initiative uh, writing, writing uh, contests and, and uh, fellowships. And, uh, you know, there's so many things. There's NBC is always looking for women, ABC, all of the networks are, they've got all got programs for mm -hmm. women to get in. Sundance everywhere like just go for it you know spend that money put money aside to join these groups and submit yourself and write something really good and really shootable maybe one or two characters in a room <laughs> <laughs> excellent excellent character and dialogue and just try to get into one of these programs in these labs you know now, yeah what did I not ask you about that I should have asked you about Oh, my new script, Ghostopus. <laughs> what? <laughs> so as I was recuperating from cancer and lying down and watching in horror the um, the tragedy at Standing Rock, the the, the Dakota oh, pipeline, yeah, send you know sending money and food and whatever I could do and just crying with anger about all of it. I I wrote a script called Ghostopus. I I set out to write the next Sharknado in three days. And it turned out to be much deeper than that. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's, I would call it an environmental comedy sci-fi horror because it's about a ghost octopus mom who was murdered by fracking, you know, by toxic dumping and was killed by, uh, you know, people on the pipeline and, and people fracking and her babies were killed and she's, seeking vengeance and she's like an animal spirit and i've tied it into the aboriginal tribes in uh, canada and they're they're one of their totem spirits is an octopus it's a it's an all-seeing hmm. wise spirit and so she's wreaking havoc on the small fishing village and um an airplane full of stewardesses crashes <laughs> And they proceed to help uh, this. There's a, a handsome, rugged, uh, bereaved lighthouse keeper who is trying to stop the carnage. Um, he finds out that Ghostopus is grieving as well, and they identify with each other. There's a, a, a coven of Wiccans that, that identify with and can communicate with her. And, of course, the Aboriginals can understand her and communicate versus the corporate monster who is starting to frack illegally and secretly on their land, which is happening now. It was just passed in Quebec. There are, are all kinds of protests happening. 
They're going to start fracking in the Maritimes. God. You know, yeah. So this is timely. I mean, this is very anti-corporate, anti-fracking, anti-pollution, anti—you know—animal extinction, all that stuff. And it's all kind of put into this farcical, absurdist comedy where it's like Jaws meets Austin Powers, but it's got a real serious message. And um, it's it's been doing well in the uh, script festivals and contests. And um, I just got into the. Uh, I've got it out through Film Fatales, through the Parody Pipeline, out to a few places, and now with this wonderful Twitter hashtag going around, I just was, I just had uh, an inquiry from um, from a executive, a developer who wants to see the script uh, from a network. So great! What's the what's the Twitter hashtag? It is the – let me go back onto Twitter. It's that whole WGA strike thing. It's called WGA uh, – one second. WGA – one second. I'm going to look too. I think I just saw it actually. Yeah, it's huge right now. It's it's the um, solidar- sol- WGA Solidarity and then it's WGA Solidarity Challenge. It's – really cool there's there's because of and wga staffing boost they are reaching out and being very selfless these these writers who are staff writers who are you know in the wga they're going on twitter because of the whole fight with the agencies Mm -hmm. understanding that because of the lockout with the with these agencies packaging everything kind of illegally double dipping I've noticed that happening and, and really was confused by it. They shut the rest of us out because we're not in the agency to be packaged and to, right. for them to skim another 10% off of. So they're, they're kind of reaching out going like, look, all of you underrepresented writers, we will read your script. We want to include you. We think that this is absolute uh, travesty what the agencies have done. They've locked out so many diverse voices and we would like to open it up. And these are these are writers who are putting their necks on the line here by doing this. It's incredible. Uh, if you just go to that hashtag, you'll see there's Liz Alper. She we've been talking. She's amazing. Um, she's in the uh, Javi Yavi Grillo. I can't pronounce it. Yavi Grillo Marquach. And it's it's basically their icon is I stand with the WGA. It's a blue circle. Anyone that's got that, just click on them, follow them. They're all writers. They're all being selfless. They're being really cool right now. And the WGA Solidarity Challenge, and they are basically putting people, if you can get recommended by a, a top tier writer, uh, which I was able to do, they will put you on a grid, a database of people and they will say, hey, networks and everybody else, you need to read these people's scripts. And literally two days later, I got an inquiry from it. Wow. Wonderful. So it's a miracle in my eyes to be able to be invited in like that when I've been shut out for so long. You know, it's yeah, it's crazy. Great. And I really thank them all for doing this. It's, it's very selfless. I'm so curious to see what's going to happen with this whole thing. <laughs> it, it, it's not sustainable because it's it's racketeering, in my opinion. It's double dipping and triple dipping. It's you can't have a monopoly like that where only your clients are working on a specific project. Writers, directors, actors, everything. Right, you can't be in charge of the whole thing. Yeah. And, you know, I understand, like, I, I get why they're doing it, but they really, I don't think that they're legally allowed to do that, to have like, well, I started noticing it was one agency back in 2007 or eight. I can't remember who it was. It was like UTA or somebody. And I was trying to pitch another script and I was directed to, you know, Mrs. X, I'm not going to say her name, who is now, who had founded a financial department at this agency. And I was very the hair was kind of raising on my arm because I was like, why would an agency need a financial department, a financing department? That means they're going to start taking over and making these productions themselves, Mm -hmm. financing it, putting 
and, and I knew it. I knew it was going to happen, and it did. And they started shutting everybody else out and making these huge monopolies. So they're just getting called out on it now, and it's 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 really not legal. <laughs> so, yeah, I just I wonder what it's going to look like when when it's all shaken out. I think it's going to be very interesting. A lot of us are going to have our scripts read, and maybe some new weird, you know, films and TV shows will come out of it. <laughs> Yeah. And, and maybe there'll be more more equality and more chance for more voices to be heard and so the same people over and over again. Well, stay tuned. We'll see what it looks like by the time this podcast comes out. Okay. Absolutely. Changing every day. I predict more women, and I hope it's it's across the board, all ages. I really do. I, I think Amen. I ha- yeah, <laughs> people of color, LGBTQ. I, it needs to open up. It it needs to open up to these other other, you know, cross sections of people that aren't just, I'm sorry, you know, young white men. Yeah. Let's have all the people tell all the stories. Absolutely. Okay. How do people find you? I am at lisahammer.com. Uh, on Instagram, I'm the Lisa at the Lisa hammer. And on Facebook, I am the Lisa hammer as well. And Twitter, I am the Lisa hammer. I think it's all the Lisa hammer. Um, but I'm I'm all over the place. Okay, um, you're on all the places. I'm on all the places, and I and I'm having fun on Instagram. I'm I'm editing this Molly Ringwald film right now, and so <laughs> uh, I wear you know kind of funky weird outfits, and so I've been I've been like posting my editing outfits. <laughs> oh my god, I'm gonna go look right now. <laughs> yeah, see if you can find the Lisa Hammer. So I'm like today I'm wearing this layered muumu with these socks and these glasses and here's a shot of Molly Ringwald being amazing. That's you know. Awesome. <laughs> so I'm still a girl. I still like girly stuff. <laughs> it was so fun talking to you. Thank you so much I loved for doing it. this. Thank, thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it and you're doing great work and I cannot wait to see what comes of all of this. You've been listening to The Other 50%, A History of Hollywood. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. I'd like to thank Lisa Hammer for sharing her story. And special thanks to Jay Rowey, Danny Rosner, and Allison McQuaid for the music. Please find us on your favorite podcast provider and leave a review. And of course, on our website, theother50percent.com, all spelled out in letters for added features, bios of our guests, and the merch. You can also follow us on all the social media platforms. And also go subscribe to catchabreakpodcast.com. Thanks for listening. See you next time.